we are at 6.03. We will give another two minutes before we really kick off the meeting. Well, Tia's people are already looking forward to talk to you. <laughs> and we have people from Ludhiana, Punjab. Nice to have you here, Karanveer. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please use chat to talk and network. It is important that we discuss things in this. Please ask your questions via chat. We would suggest you put in your questions in the, in the chat. Uh, and then, you know, in the end, if we do have time, we will also uh, like if you want to speak, we will we will try to give you some time to, you know, ask your questions directly. One more minute to go before we start. Hey, Nima from Kochi. Hey, Ashwini from Hyderabad. But you are in US. Thank you for joining so early in the morning. Why is the doorbell ringing? Hey, Andy from Bangalore. All right, I think we are at 6.05, so we can get started. Uh, thank you again for people who just joined. I'm Sarandeep. I'm the co-founder of Women in Voice India. We are hosting this meeting in collaboration with the very awesome team at Haptic. And my co-host for today is the awesome, awesome, awesome Bhagashri. And we have amazing lineup of, spe lineup of speakers today. Uh, so without taking too much of uh, too much of the time, I will hand it over to Bhagishri to run the show. Uh, please feel free to ask your questions in the chat. Uh, the speakers will, uh, you know, be will try to answer as many of them as as we could. We've also, uh, you know, we had also sent a form initially to get some questions. Those will be addressed first. But please feel free to ask your questions in the chat, and we'll be happy to take them. Over to you, Bhagishri. And yeah, looking forward to the session. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, Saran. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you can see me as well as the um, deck that I'm trying to share. Um, yeah, so um, I'll just uh, try and give you an overview of uh, uh, about the whole concept of conducting this event. Um, so we, while working, we all are working into um, conversation uh, AI space where we design the bots, we design conversations for various clients uh, for uh, to resolve their problems and to deliver some solutions. So while working on it, we observed that you know there are certain um, differences in the uh, design process or um, the perspective. Uh, towards design, conversation design, and the overall user experience of the chatbot. Um, this this is com a, a bit different than the uh, international uh, clients. When we deal with Indian clients, uh, this perspective of accepting the bot and looking at the bot, the expectations of uh, the whole process is a little different. So here we are now to discuss uh, a lot more on conversation design that is happening in India and uh, the challenges that we all face while uh, designing the bot and how to deal with it. And uh, are there any tricks and tips? Uh, is there any hack that we can try and deliver a good user experience to the customers in India? Let's get started. Um, so, okay, so here we have Avni from Haptic, we have Tias uh, from Skid.ai, and uh, we also have uh, Minu from Amelia. Uh, why don't you guys uh, introduce yourself, Avni? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Bhagashree, for introducing me. Um, uh, 
I'm Mavni. I've been at Hapstage for about three years now, um, and my journey as a conversation designer has been um, very exciting, to be honest. I don't come from a tech background, so I I basically undergraduated as a fashion student, um, and then I moved on to studying design thinking as my master, which is when I got introduced to this whole space of UI UX and also chatbots. And um, I'm really grateful to that professor even today who told me to go interview at Haptic because when I'd gone to Haptic, I actually went to interview as a UX designer. But uh, when I when I reached there, they introduced me to the space of conversation design, and I'm so so thankful for that because this journey has been so grateful, fulfilling, and uh, satisfying as a designer. Um, you know, with all the work that we are currently doing with, uh, you know, Geomart uh, specifically, and then collaborating with the Meta team, I really now have a vision of what conversation design is and what it holds in the future, the importance of it. So I'm really excited to share that with you guys, you know, all the little learnings, insights that I've learned today. And I'm also looking forward to hear from everybody else, also Tiaz, Minu, Anjali. So yeah, thank you for having me, Bhavishri. Yeah, thank you so much, Avni. Uh, so good to have you. Uh, Tiaz, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, sure, Bhagyasri. First of all, thank you so much for the beautiful introduction. I think everyone on the call is aware what we are planning to do today. So thank you so much for that. And I think I have a lot of similarities with uh, Vini, uh, who just, you know, uh, mentioned one thing that they do not come from a tech background. Same with me. I do not come from a tech background. I'm a literature student. I graduated as a literature student. And after that, I got into the space of UX design. So when I got into design, I thought that, dude, I'm missing out on writing. I'm missing out on language. Where do I get that, right? And uh, again, I think mentorship is very important, like Avni has also gotten a professor I got a person who was in the space of UX at that point of time and he kind of mentored me saying that uh, you want to write and you know UX why don't you just put the hands together right and uh, that's when my journey started back in 2017 so I have been designing chatbots uh, and uh, for multiple platforms and then gradually a uh, couple of uh, skills on voice as well and then my like the current stint that I am in is at Skit uh, I am a part of Skit from 2020 uh, I have just completed two years a couple of months back and um, yeah, so here I have been designing for voice and I have been helping enabling multiple voice related automation and design. And I think I would be able to share whatever I have learned because this is an ever evolving domain, right? And uh, there is no strict part path to it and it, it's an open forum I call it an open forum you can learn from anywhere it's almost like uh, you know uh, uh, talking about Ranshor Das Chachar who said that Bacha Gyan bat raha hai. just you know you can get it from anywhere so that's what you observe and that's how you do so I'm just hoping I can talk about all of that yeah thank you yeah, of course uh, we are so, so glad to have you Tias thank you so much uh, and we also have Minu from Amelia Hi, Minu. Hi, yeah, so I am Minu Sara Paul. I work at Amelia, uh, the Bangalore division. I am the conversation design lead there. Uh, like I think the both of them, I also chanced upon this profession. I actually didn't know that, you know, this field existed before I uh, actually ventured into this. And I mean, I'm so glad I did. Um, so I did my master's in linguistics and then I went on to do a PhD in audiovisual translation. And it's, it's very um, odd, but I don't know, uh, audiovisual translation, I worked on subtitles extensively and this, uh, you know, the short and crisp way we have to um, deal with conversation designing as well. That's got a lot of similarity uh, with subtitling as well, I feel. And I was very happy that um, I, I mean, I got this job and I started writing and it was, it, it's amazing, right? And collaborate with people, like-minded people. Um, that's been amazing. And that's what I look forward to doing here. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. We have um, various backgrounds who, uh, of people who are working into this space. People from, come from literature, people, come from UX background. And there are some people who come from technical background. It's, it's a conversation design space is so welcoming and accommodative. 
so we uh, send, uh, sent out this um, uh, pre-registration form on uh, LinkedIn a, a couple of weeks ago. And we received that, uh, you know, conversation designers in India are facing a lot of challenges into this these all areas. They want to know about um, what is a better channel, chat or voice. They want to know about what could be the best uh, bot response, what are good policies, what could be the effective portfolio for me if I'm a new person into the space, uh, what is important, uh, is storytelling important, all these challenges. So what we did, uh, we collated all these questions and uh, we, are, we have now uh, allocated all these questions to, we are going to ask these questions to these experts and let's know what what are these tricks and what do these um, experts do while designing the conversation? So Tias, uh, for you, this is the first question. Yes. Um, if I'm a new person, how can I build an effective portfolio? Um, if I'm not currently working on conversation design, what are the great tips from you? Sure, sure. I'd like to take a stab at it. So uh, as I was saying, right, this is a domain which is kind of an open forum, right? You can learn from anywhere and everywhere. So I think before you start to take a career in conversation design, you just know which part you like in conversation design, right? Let's say um, designing the UX part, the user journey mapping and everything from, you know, fallbacks to recovery to handling of edge cases is one part, that is the design part. The other part is the writing or how your consumer facet writing is catering to the people that you're writing for. So these two things are, I, I, I feel are major things to mm. you know, keep in mind or to choose from, let's say. Mm. So I personally uh, you know, would prefer to uh, depict my portfolio in a way which shows which angle of these two things I prefer or I can, um, work on better or are my forte, I would say, right? Mm -hmm. And even if you're coming from any other background, even if you're coming from, let's say, uh, as, as we just learned, uh, we are all from different, different backgrounds. Uh, let's say even if you're not remotely even connected to conversation design anywhere, just try to identify this one path, which you can show some value on or which you think you can add some value on, right? So um, first, once you orient yourself towards that, you can orient your portfolio to show this uh, the upper hand basically right and between these two things any of it could actually take the upper hand and is acceptable is what i believe right so uh, let's let's just start as an abc if i have to tell you i think when you're creating a portfolio you call yourself a conversation design we feel this imposter syndrome that okay i have never worked with a conversation should i even call myself that mm. i feel you should call yourself that if you want to because the person who is reviewing does not know abc's about you right they the only proof of your recognition is there in their hand through your cv or your portfolio so definitely start with calling yourself a conversation designer and mention the major skills that you're part of now you will tell me that you know how will i get, gain these skills again open forum there are so many books there are so many books and i personally read only books initially right and they gave a lot of it's like a grammar book it's like what to do and not to do, right? And that kind of helps a lot. So read the books. There are certain free courses online that you can find, let's say in Udemy or LinkedIn Learning. Go ahead and do that if you don't want to spend money. Because, you know, Voice Tech Global or Conversation Design Institute, they, they, these are paid courses. So you might not be ready for that, you know, mm -hmm. at once. So just go ahead and try the free courses that are there online. And if you really research, you will find a lot of them that then try to find what other people are doing. There are a lot of scope where you can see what these brands are automating. Let's say uh, uh, HDFC Bank, for example, the EVA bot is so like we have it for so long, right? Is one of the pioneers, I would say. So go and see the experience over there. At least learn the subject. You don't mm. have to be an expert in the subject to build your first portfolio. Mm. So the new base set up according to me. Then I think your portfolio should be in a website format, right? You want to give it a format which is easily navigatable. Mm. And you want to give that leverage. You don't want to constrict the viewer, 
right? You want to give the leverage to the person who is viewing it. You are mm -hmm. just taking them through slides might not be the, you know, brightest experience, but you give them a website and wow them with multiple segments and fill that up might add a lot of value, I believe, right? So a major chunk of your portfolio can go in case studies because mm -hmm. case studies are where you show the value that you can add. So in case studies, I would say that, you know, inclination towards, again, the one of these two, the writing part or the UX part should be very much visible. Some bit of UX you need to still follow. And as I said that there are, again, a lot of resources online, Don Normans, everything is online, right? You can learn about heuristics, you can learn about UX processes. So try to step-by-step step categorize it in a way where you are talking about requirement gathering, research, then coming up with an information architecture, then coming up with a user journey mapping, then writing your prompts or designing your conversation. Build it in a step-by-step step manner mm -hmm. and you try to show your decision-making process in every step, why you did what you did right so try to formulate it in a way don't go or don't shoot for stars right away because you're just starting up and if people know that you are a fresher in conversation design field they will consider that mm -hmm. but it's not expected that an expert design will suddenly come out of you so mm -hmm. just try to focus on the basics and try to take simpler use cases which are impactful let's say a order tracking scenario it is an impactful case for a business and you really want to show how easily you're helping the user in a you know minute few steps to get their order tracked right so that value that you're adding makes more sense in your case study and again while uh, you know designing your case studies you can take two approaches i believe one could be sorry uh, was there anything can i continue yeah yeah please okay, okay yeah. i thought i thought somebody spoke sorry yeah so i was saying that um, uh, let's say while doing the case studies you can take two approaches right one could be that you have identified a particular format and you want format of conversation design and you want to apply to companies that deal in those like mm -hmm. chat let's say there mm -hmm. are other channels also chat voice multi-model push notification or sms trigger right or ivr design these are different kinds of conversation design so if you are orienting yourself to you know apply for a particular part of conversation design in any of these, your case study should talk about that. Mm -hmm. That is one approach, right? Second approach could be, I want to do it all. I am okay with any kind of conversation design, right? Mm -hmm. Then create, I think, more than two case studies, which can cater to at least three different channels like this, chat, voice, voice multimodal, and things like that, right? So the complete design nuances should be adhering to this channel that you're choosing. One tiny example, let's say you're showcasing a case study, which is a chat bot or a chat automation, right? You would want to show the placement of your emojis and the reasoning or the thought process behind it, right? If you're using emojis, talk about why you are using emojis. Mm -hmm. If you're not using emojis, talk about why you are not using emojis. Mm -hmm. If you're using buttons or let's say carousal cards, for Messenger, we use a lot of carousal cards, right? So just specify why this kind of a representation was chosen in the first place, right? So all these things come out from the channel selection part. Similarly with voice, you can't really uh, show the visual part of things. So what you do, you try to intonate your prompts in a better way. That from uh, when text to speech is happening, let's say, and uh, you have these uh, speech uh, markup languages, SSML tags, we call it, right? So you want to increase or decrease the prosody and make it more human in nature or more uh, catering to the user group that you're targeting, right? So these kind of nuances you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with particular channels, mm -hmm. right? I think apart from case studies, the other segment that can still uh, add something about your overall experience you will be like let's say you're coming from a ux writing background or you're coming from a content writing technical writing background and you'll be like okay all these years of work will go nowhere the best possible way to represent that could be your resources section create a resources section in your website right there you can show that these are some of the different processes that i've worked on these mm -hmm. are some of my published papers these are some of the things that i have been 
adhering to or connected to this is a dummy project that i have created right so all these things can go into your resources and your case studies part can see the complete design uh, life cycle i would say at the end you know accompanied by a particular prototype that you would want to use right so all these segments when you have done the closure part of the conclusion could be how as a designer you think so you could just add certain segments or certain pointers on your design thinking approaches that if this is the audience this is the geography this is the language i am catering to these mm. are the design decisions that i would be making to give them a overall general approach right so i think conversation design first cut portfolio is something that is a uh, subject to a lot of experimentation right yes. and it's beautiful i believe so uh, just go ahead guys if you want to build your first portfolio just go ahead and build it because uh, once you have once you start you no know, a lot of things will start appearing in your head which might not be once you're theoretically just thinking about it might not come to you right away see i think bhagyashree this would be my take on it yeah definitely this is very insightful to us i must say um anjali uh, hey hi anjali um Hi, Bhagyesh. Hey, hi. Um, so, why don't you introduce yourself and uh, let us know your take on this? Sure, Can we sure. uh, see you? Uh, Can you turn the video on? Um, there is something really wrong with my camera. I'm really <laughs> sorry. That's why. That's okay. That's okay. 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 Also, I'm on my cellular data, so if you cannot hear me, if there's a lag, please do let me know. Sure. Okay. All right. So first of all, I do want to extend uh, my thanks to you, Bhagyashree, for allowing me to speak today. And I'm so thrilled to be here with, um, you know, all these wonderful people, because um, I'm not just here to listen and to learn from my peers, but um, I'd also like to, and I hope to, you know, kind of provide um, some sort of insights from my own journey uh, to, you know, um, all these budding conversation designers uh, of today. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I come from an engineering background. So I did my BTEC in electronics and communication, which has nothing to do with conversation design. Um, and I started my career by um, being a business analyst. And then I worked my way up to project management. Um, and then I did, so, so that was in the mobile application space. And then um, I, I shifted to the conversational AI space. But I was a I was a project manager there, and uh, for the longest time, um, while I was managing projects, I kept focusing on the quality and the user experience part, and I really did not like, um, you know, the whole uh, just just you know delivering projects and managing um, on a daily basis. So I just took a leap of faith. I spoke to my manager. Um, and I did speak to the only person, the only other conversation designer I knew, um, and I learned a few things. And then I, I did some research on my own. Um, and then I, and um, I think my, my, the management or the company that I worked for mm -hmm. earlier, it was just so nice to, um, you know, kind of allow me to go into this role. And uh, it, it just fit right in. And um, then I shifted to yellow. Um, and uh, I've been here for almost a year. Nice, wonderful. So nice to have you, Anjali. Uh, thank you so much for joining. And um, I'm sure we are uh, going to take away a lot uh, from your experience as well. Um, so Anjali, this question is to you as well. Uh, we would like to know uh, for a new person who is uh, joining conversation design space, uh, yeah. what is your take on uh, building an effective portfolio for them? Right. Right. So um, I, I did listen to what Tia uh, said, and, and I completely agree with her. Um, I don't want to repeat the same points. I, I think I'd like just add, you know like to add a few things. So um, I, I guess if, if you're trying to get your foot in the door, I think you um, need to evaluate your existing skill set and mm -hmm. see how you can leverage uh, them into you know transitioning into this world of conversation design. Um, and the way I look at it, and, and honestly, this comes from, from my recruitment tales, um, there are some innate traits uh, or, or skills that a potential, uh, you know, candidate needs to possess. Um, and then there are other skills that, that can be taught to them, right, either by a team lead or their peers 
or what they can learn through their you know, own journeys. So I would put them into two buckets. Um, one would be essential skills or must-haves. And then the other one would be uh, nice to have skills, right? So if you talk about essential skills, I think logical um, analysis or thinking, um, creativity, uh, user-centric thinking, um, and then obviously um, effective communication, right? So, so these are must-haves, right? So, but, but how do you, at the end of the day, you know, showcase this? when you're trying to you know, um, apply for a conversation designer role. So um, logical thinking, I would say if, if you have um, uh, experience in you know, creating flow charts, or if, if you can design one on your own and show how you um, have optimized it, I think that, that kind of shows. Um, creative creativity or creative writing, um, if you do, come from maybe let's say content writing background uh, or, or UX writing uh, background, or maybe you, um, you know, write articles or, or maybe blogs as like a side hobby. Um, mm -hmm. I think showcasing these kind of links would, would allow the recruiter to, uh, you know, really understand your creative sense. Um, user centric thinking. Uh, I, Yes, this could be highlighted if um, you know you have previous exposure to uh, you know working for any sort of software solutions like you know that caters to uh, you know uh, end users out there. So, so this is where um, I think um, I was lucky because all of my projects, uh, you know, because being a business analyst and a project manager, I, I really did, I had to really keep the user in mind. So all of my projects fit in um, and they were relevant to the job that I was applying for. Um, next is effective communication. Um, I mean, you know, initially in your initial screening round, I think recruiters would probably spend like what, a, a minute or so just, just kind of, uh, glancing over your resume or portfolio or anything. Um, so you have to really, you know, make um, make a point there. You can't just ramble on about, uh, you know, all the different projects that you've uh, worked on. So um, you, you really have to highlight, um, you know, um, in your cover letter or in your LinkedIn description uh, or your resume, um, you know, the, the ability to be an effective communicator by really just getting to the point, right? And um, I think freelancing, I think freelance work is also um, quite desirable now um, because if, if you have freelance, uh, um, you know, opportunities, experience from the past, uh, I know oftentimes, especially in India, it, it's still, um, it, you know, it, it's still new, uh, not a lot of um, recruiters are open to, um, you know, considering that experience, but I, I think it really um, should be included because mm -hmm. if you have freelance experience, it's, it's a really good way to kind of um, underscore your ability to, you know, forge and uh, establish relationships with, you know, customers and um, be a very important individual contributor to, you know, a much larger business goal. So, so these are the essential skills. Um, the other one was nice to have skills. So those are kind of like, you know, the basic conversation design guidelines. Um, again, there, there's tons of resources out there online. You can even go through Kathy Pearl's Medium blogs, um, her videos on YouTube. Uh, Google has its own, um, you know, conversation design guidelines. Um, so you can go through that, but even if you don't, um, have if just, you know, if you have elementary knowledge, it's okay. Um, if, if you have any work or experience with some sort of design tools, um, that could be made, um, you know, um, use in use of when you're actually working as a conversation designer, right? So lucid chart, draw dot IO, things like that. Um, that, that's a nice skill to have, uh, to highlight in your resume, um, cross-functional team experience. Um, that's something that um, is nice to have because at the end of the day, uh, at least like in, in if you talk about my teams, we we tend to um, you know interact with 
uh, pre-sales folks, clients, business analysts, QA teams, developers. So cross-functional team uh, experience is good as well. Um, and then um, each company has their own implementation journey, the way, you know, the kind of processes that they follow in order to, you know, create and deliver this conversational AI agent. So, um, I mean, if you come from a similar background or if you're aware of it, then uh, I think it's a nice skill to have. And um, obviously all of this is gonna be reflected in your, in your resume and portfolio. Um, and I think there's, there's something that um, I have in common with, with Tia's, uh, what she mentioned. So that's about the kind of conversation designer you want to be, right? Um, so I think all this really does depend on the kind of team you, you want to be a part of. Um, and I say this because um, a while ago, I, I had the opportunity to, to speak with um, the C, COO of Conversation Design Institute. Um, so he kind of opened my eyes and he, he described, you know, how he envisions an ideal conversation design team to look like. So he said there would be someone who takes care of the actual architecture, optimization, you know, of the flow. Um, somebody who then takes care of the copywriting that has to be persona aligned. Um, and then there's, you know, the AI trainer or the, or the consultant who kind of, um, you know, leverages conversational analytics and then drives insights from them and then takes it back to the team and says, hey, this is the way we have been designing a certain, um, uh, you know, uh, a flow, but, you know, this is probably what we should do. Um, you know, we should change it. So what I'm trying to say is try and think of what kind of a designer you want to be and then see what kind of uh, skills you could uh, probably highlight to match these individual conversation design team. Um, there's also, I think Tias also spoke about this, um, creating your own portfolio. So self-initiated projects. So if you really don't have any actual experience that you can highlight in your resume, um, maybe create one, right? So draw.io, those kind of tools are very easy to use. So if you can just pick up a use case, very simple use case, um, if you can show your um, design thinking journey mapping, uh, optimize it. And if you can kind of have a short description um, as to what your understanding is um, of the business objectives and the goals and how that is uh, you know, perfectly captured in your design, um, you know, what your understanding of the target user is. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, how did you uh, kind of... Um, you know, define the bot persona and how are you mm -hmm. kind of reflecting that in your uh, design? I think if you if you go the extra mile and sort of create these sample projects yourself um, and add that to your portfolio, I think um, I, I, I think the potential employers would be really, really uh, interested and in, in, in intrigued. Yeah, that that's very insightful, Anjali. Um... Uh, thank you so much for sharing your points as well. Um, yeah, so Nino, um, um, yeah, so just uh, one thing in in the interest of time, uh, let's just keep uh, five to seven minutes for each question so, so that we cover all the questions and uh, we all have answers to the important questions that we already have in our minds. I'm sure these are... Uh, uh, questions where you know we want to speak uh, a lot but let's uh, in the interest of time let's uh, keep it short uh, cool uh, Mino um, what do you think is um, you know how to design a graceful um, uh, the graceful bot responses for error handling cases so by error handling cases I um, we also consider the edge cases or you know when um, uh, the the path is not very happy path and there are some problems in the uh, there could be some technical problems server error api is not working something of that sort how to design these responses um in in such such a scenario yeah so <clears throat> this is a great question because um, along with designing the happy path we as conversation designers we are also uh, 
we also need to handle the other side of things which is when things go wrong right and okay. us as human beings uh, we will be able to come up with on the spot responses but for conversational ai we will need to teach them up front as to what needs to be said and when that needs to be said specifically so we also need to keep in mind that there couldn't always be one solution uh, for the different channels we are designing it for Uh, so for voice we might handle a particular error in a, a way and for chat we might handle it differently so the main question here is before i even try to answer this question what do we identify as errors um, it could be multiple things multiple scenarios for instance take a voice scenario um, so at the beginning of uh, a conversation the conversational ai might ask what can i help you with and uh, there is a good possibility that the uh, person at the end of the you know uh, call is not saying anything so at that point how do we expect the bot to respond right so here of course we want to give them the benefit of doubt they might not have heard the question uh, so we cannot just go on and cut the call right that's that's not graceful uh, and that's that's not human like as well right Uh, and we are aiming to be conversational ai so we need to uh, be as close to humans as possible uh, so when you do not hear anything uh, the first thing would be to wait uh, for 3 to 4 seconds and then repeat the question but repeating the question i do not mean the exact same words what can i help you with what can i help you with that that doesn't sound nice so uh, as as human beings we will also change up the wordings a little bit uh, so we could explain the uh, situation so we could uh, for instance say i don't think i heard you there uh, how can i assist you today so if they haven't if they haven't uh, been able to speak they could speak at this point of time and now again if you do not get a response then yeah then you need to uh, think of other uh, ways in which you can handle it so what i do is give them information as to what they can do instead of speaking with the conversational ai at that point of time uh, so this is a voice scenario we could give them an email id or direct them to a chat and say that you know you can also reach out to uh, me here um, or the company there uh, give them an email id give them a chat bot ch chat id or uh, we can always ask them to call back when they are ready with the question right that's also one way of handling it Yeah. So th this is a scenario where uh, you do not even know the intention of the user right we do not know the intent the cai uh, the conversational ai doesn't know what the user's intention is now you have cases where you've already started the conversation uh, that's that's where we already know the intent but in the middle of the conversation you do not know uh, what's happening so it's basically it's not progressing along the happy path uh, so it's so let's say there is a scenario where you are expecting the person to give you some crucial information uh, for instance they calling to renew their insurance and we need the policy date and without which we cannot proceed right uh, so one way to handle this is to tell them that you know this information is crucial and i need it to progress but we can also make it more user friendly by telling them where to find this information so if they say i don't know where my account uh, where my uh, policy number is you can tell them where it is so uh, yeah so so by that we will uh, you know de i mean like yeah de route them to uh, reroute them to uh, the happy path so that is one way of dealing with that uh, sort of an error yeah hmm And, yeah this is uh, Yeah. Yeah, this is this is a great idea to reroute them to a happy path in a graceful way uh, in a way that uh, the bot sounds helpful uh, at the same time. Yeah, and another error uh, can occur right at the beginning of this conversational AI the the conversation right where uh, the conversational AI could actually understand the intent wrongly. Mm. Um and this is where us as CDs we need to be super careful. Yeah. um so we need to design instances where someone could exit the conversation gracefully as well so they do not have to like go through the entirety of the conversation before like exiting and uh, taking a different turn uh so we can avoid this by doing by you know making a very small change or yeah. by making a very very simple thing like getting confirmation done at the very beginning so if i if i say that i want to renew my uh, policy uh, you could just say you know uh you want me to help 
you renew your insurance right and if they give you an affirmative progress otherwise right. yeah so with that you are uh, i mean saving a lot of time and the user experience is good enough mm. uh, yeah and that way we are still handling the error and hopefully containing it as well right right and, right and uh, sorry bagishri uh, do you want to add something uh no i i was just um asserting to what you are saying yeah this is this is definitely helpful um uh, uh can i um tias uh, can you also uh, share your inputs on this yeah sure i think um, i think minu covered a lot of it uh, right so i'll take it from there so that uh, in the interest of time we are able to close it also right so um, what minu was trying to say i think i'll take it from there because i also divide these errors in the type of the errors i mm -hmm. call them user initiated error bot initiated error and situational error now what is a uh, bot initiated error right so i think all of that uh, minu has already mentioned but i would still like to pick up on two three things uh, let's say that your particular bot or your particular uh, chat bot uh, is semantic based let's say uh, semantic based in case of chat and asr based in case of voice so something is not easily identified or the bot went to a different route right mm -hmm. so how to bring them back because you don't really want to lose out on a customer mm -hmm. now it can be a true uh, you know a confusion i would say or can be a false capture in itself so i think while error handling is being thought about it's a matter of collaboration with your ml counterpart also the machine learning team or the nlp team that you are working on because they can help you set the confidence threshold let's say right beyond which you will probably ask for a confirmation below which you will probably go ahead with what you were doing let's say like that something something of that sort so bot initiated uh, problems or bot initiated errors could be always designed for with the intent of the persona that you are depicting as well for example uh, you are designing for voice right and you need to give a bigger example or, or a bigger information but you know that in this information there are jargons or you know in this information there can be follow up questions right let's say something like uh, okay your appointment is booked and you can expect the technician to visit your place mm -hmm. but what if somebody asks okay what will be the charges have mm -hmm. you thought of that so that is also an error handling case so right. think about from a user's perspective what are the things that you would do if mm -hmm. a incomplete information comes to you so mm -hmm. you expand them and you have that and you don't uh, generally constrict users if you have a leverage of cross flow transitions right like from at the end of one flow if a user wants to just directly digress you want to digress help them and then come back to your flow you don't yeah. not want to help them right but also limit your uh, you know arena because users tend to digress at least indian audience tend yeah. to digress we love speaking right all of us love speaking so we tend to digress a lot your uh, focus should be i will digress i will help them but i'll also limit that if you see continuously people are digressing you put a counter logic over there yeah. you right yeah. and you stop it at some point maybe two turns you are allowing right mm -hmm. um or let's say there is an api failure as very rightly mentioned by bhagish you give them a way out you never not want to help them right mm -hmm. you give them the next possible way out if you are on voice you can probably go ahead and schedule a call back if you are on chat you can probably direct them giving a link to a website or an app that they can download and get the information right yeah. so yeah. multi model capability helps a lot in error handling i would say if you don't have the leverage of multi model then try mm -hmm. to see how you can stop the user initiated actions let's say you like when you say that okay uh, you know um, i can't help you with that please call us back in some time if a api failure happens mm -hmm. you don't know the user will call back correct right correct. you don't know and you might lose out on that lead or lose out on that user so you yeah. want to bring them back to track by telling them all right i will call you back in some time to yeah. help you with this in the meantime you can maybe look at our website Hmm. So we have, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry. So we have yeah. Chitra. Um, she has a question. Chitra, why don't you um, unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Hi, Chitra. Okay, maybe uh, when you come back, 
please unmute yourself and um, ask the question that you have. She has a question related to uh, metrics of uh, error handling. Um, we'll wait for her to come back and ask the question. Cool. Um, Avni, um, what do you think are the engagement techniques uh, that would work for Indian users? And what are the different challenges uh, that, you yeah, that you faced while working with or for the Indian user base? And how did you tackle them? Hi, uh, this is a very interesting question, Bhagasi. And I think a part of this, uh, a lot of uh, uh, insights were shared by TS and Nino already in the previous question. So um, I'll just take it from there. I think one thing that TS mentioned about is that think of the end user. So as conversation designers, you know, we only focus on or we are expected to focus more on the copies uh, and everything else. But to know what kind of copies you want to design, you have to understand your user. So really try and look at who your target audience is. Ask these questions to the business who have come in for a requirement or a problem that they're trying to solve. Who is their end user? What is their age group? Uh, what is the demography of that user? You know, are they tech savvy? Do they know English? Uh, what is their first language? I think this will help you kind of understand the tone of voice that you're going to have mm -hmm. to build those copies also, right? I think that sets a very strong base for you as a designer to even design that experience, not just your copy. So I think that is the first step that you start with by understanding a user. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think um, as designers, we are expected to uh, put that emphasis on the user persona because that is kind of skipped out from just the whole project life cycle, right? So we have to bring it back to attention. We have to tell them that, you know, let's just first understand your user. So you create one or ask your business to provide one for you. Either way, do it. Do it as a very important step for your project. Mm -hmm. I think after that, you also have to focus on, um, you know, designing for quick adoption. Um, you know, like I said, you know, we don't know who, who your users are. So don't think or assume things that because you know it, that your users will also know it. Um, no, think of it from a very layman perspective. Design your copy so micro and so easy to read that will lead to better adoption. Um, right. And I think, um, you know, today, because we are surrounded by technology so much, I don't think there's a need for reinventing a wheel, you know. I think we should just leverage the fact that there's a very strong base mental model set for a lot of users for a lot of things. So mm -hmm. use that in your copies, you know. Don't try and make it so fancy that, you know, your user is just completely lost. That will, in fact, lead to drop off. So think of it from a perspective where, you know, use simple language, but also see if it is getting adopted as quickly as possible or not. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we are also designing think of your parents as users, you know, that's just the most easiest way to look at it. Because my parents, they know how to read English, probably they don't know how to speak it. So even focus on that, or focus on your parents, focus on people around you, like your house health, right? Like, I think uh, whenever I'm designing stuff, I also want to make sure that I design for multiple regional languages. Like that is a very important technique to be more inclusive in your experience, right? So give that option for having to choose from not just English as a language, but Hindi or Marathi or whatever audience that you're designing for. So being inclusive, I think is again, very, very important today when we are designing any type of an experience. And now, because we've talked about user persona, equally bot persona is also important, right? To be more engaging for your user. Don't just make it very transactional and robotic. And that is not what a lot of business want also today. I think uh, a lot of businesses are trying to explore that engaging side of, um, you know, technology where how much more engaging can I be with my gender, uh, with my name, or, uh, you know, that will set a base for your small talk also apart from your happy flow or the requirement that you're solving for. Or uh, let's take WhatsApp as an example, right? Like when a user is chatting on WhatsApp because it's already a medium for you to talk to your friends or your family. So they are so familiar with it. So, you know, that having a strong but bot persona will make your small talk also more stronger. Mm -hmm. Let's say if a user is just writing, uh, who are you? So my bot should not break at that point. It should give a response that is as engaging like, hey, my name is so-and-so and I'm here to help you with these menu items. And then on, bring that user to your experience or to the use case that you're trying to solve for. Mm. So, right, like user persona, bot persona, equally, equally important. Um, mm. And um, certain tips and tricks that you can take care of is by, one is add a lot of emojis. I think 
because we focus so much on the copy we forget that there are emojis that we can use you know that will just bring a smile to your user's face that oh this is just like talking to a friend yeah. you know take this as a takeaway from all of us i think on the panel we all agree to make use of emojis and push for it because a lot of businesses don't want to do that and that kind of is sad because it is so boring to just look at text and copy make use yeah. of emojis is so yeah. important yeah exactly yeah. so uh, did you face any challenges while working uh, for the indian user base um, yeah yeah i'll i'll talk about that actually i was coming to that in my next point right i think uh, once you've done your design go back to looking at the analytics right to understand what your bot is doing how it is performing what is the behavior what is the user behavior um just take certain data driven decisions from then on to kind of solve for issues after you have gone live right one thing that i think we noticed very early on once we went live was that on whatsapp specifically people are very used to chatting with the bot in english as a language which we did not cater for right because english is the first language that, that we first thought for probably hindi we will do but english we completely overlooked so that was one of the big challenge that we kind of brought towards the product team also to kind of make a model that we could train our system to even recognize english and then from then on you can choose to at least respond in whatever language you are capable for like you choose english as a response or choose hindi but at least identify what the copy is that the user is writing because english again is a very common chat language these days at least on whatsapp yeah. so i think that was one challenge that we faced and we tried to solve for yeah i think this is true for um, a lot of indian languages uh, for marathi so i am a marathi speaker uh, while typing marathi also uh, i hardly use devanagari i mostly right. use roman script and that's uh, minglish probably as they say but whatever mm -hmm. so this combination this is a very important point of me uh, thanks for bringing that up sure thank you cool um okay why is it not moving okay yeah so anjali uh, this question is to you first uh, how do we explain a uh, conversation design experience uh, to our clients and what are the tricks and tips that uh, could be uh, used to effectively explain your conversation experience design uh, to the client right um so i think first and foremost you need to kind of uh um really get to know your client first in the initial few calls in the discovery uh, stage itself um because um you know there there are a lot of different types of clients there are tech savvy non tech savvy some of them come with in depth knowledge of you know conversation design some of them um have no idea what it is about even if you try and explain it to them they really do not care um and then some of them have like a vague idea but they're you know interested to know more and they look up to you as experts right so in that case i think you need to that's probably the starting point so where do you, or exactly do you need to start from right um because if you're talking to experts and you're going to give like a an hour long workshop uh yeah. starting from the basics it's it's not going to be um useful so um i would still say um stick to what the basics are what exactly is conversation conversation design in a nutshell um but then kind of bring it back to the kind of um, you know business objectives or the their business solutions right uh, or problems that you're trying to address through your design um while showcasing your design um quite recently actually this happened to uh one of uh, my team members so we had a non tech savvy client and who was um you know who didn't really know much about conversation design uh mm -hmm. didn't even know much about you know flow charts or journey mapping um and it was a really complex um healthcare solutions uh you know uh use case um so what we did is we had all of the uh two three long or or complex journeys mm -hmm. mapped out um and uh because we were running short of time and the client was kind of on on leave in between we were trying to showcase everything at once and there were a lot of people in the team and um um i think what happened there is the the client kind of looked at the journey and the script and everything together as a whole mm -hmm. and started wondering okay why is it so complex um so the client did not understand okay how is this conversation design how is it going to look 
for, you know, look like for the end user. So mm -hmm. we had to figure out a way to kind of take away the complexity of the design mm -hmm. and the tech part of it and only um, showcase to them what are we trying to build for only the end user? What does it look like to the end user? So what we did there is kind of take it step by step, use case mm -hmm. by use case. Right. Um, on call, what we did is kind of did a little bit of role playing where one person would, because it was it was for voice. So mm -hmm. we would, you know, one person would act like the bot, the other person would act like um, the end user. And when we read it out, just a happy path, um, um, you know, we the person kind of uh, or the client, um, you know, quickly grabbed mm -hmm. onto that. And then it was it was just an easy way to start off, uh, mm -hmm. and then for you know clients who are or don't shy away from looking at detailed um, you know designs and copywriting or flowcharts, mm -hmm. uh, what we try to do there is you know uh, we share our screens, we send it across, and we take it journey by journey, and mm -hmm. then um, because they kind of understand the high level flow, they understand where the data points are you know added, what we're trying to capture, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day. Um, you know, they don't understand the hidden aspects of your design. Um, so just, just for an example, um, I'm going to take the simplest example, actually, FAQs. We get a lot of FAQ bots. And uh, we often rely on the client for their set of FAQs. And mm -hmm. what we get is sheets and sheets of, um, you know, very verbose, yeah. um, you know, <laughs> questions which contain mostly relevant things, but some, you know, uh, even we can just look at and we're like, no, we need to cut down on it. But they're not willing to, um, you know, do that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we're trying to employ the Jenga technique there and sort of retain the context, but, you know, cut away all of which is not necessary for user. So um, those kind of things, if you try and tell them upfront, they're not, it's not going to register. You would kind of um, maybe in your demo stage, or you can just take a, a sample of something that you've done earlier um, mm -hmm. and show it to them then and there. And um, I think that's, that's really easy to get through to them that way. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. I, I had faced a similar uh, situation once. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, what do you say about it? Um, what is the best way to explain your design to the client? Sure, sure, Bhagyashri. So basically, I totally agree with what Anjali uh, also mentioned, right? Uh, to me, I would give one very uh, regular example, right? Think mm -hmm. of any Indian um, con consumer, right? Mm -hmm. Think of any Indian consumer. Do we still prefer going to the mall and shopping or do we still prefer online shopping? Mm -hmm. So all of us somewhere rely on look and feel of things. And that is what you would get in your Indian clients also right and that's the that's the logic guys that's the, the simple logic everyone wants to see as anjali mentioned everyone wants to see what it looks like or how it will feel how it will actually uh, you know come out to be so one if you have a good very supportive person from the client's team get yourself introduced come front come up front and get yourself introduced and make them over the process make them familiarize with your process Right. right until and unless you do that they will always be in this mysterious zone ki what is happening what is happening right so be in all inception calls and the calls that follow afterwards with your uh, you know uh, tag along with your project manager or whoever is the spokesperson stakeholders over there right so just be there be a visible face yeah. so your customer knows that that is you and you are owner of design and you can even conduct workshops also as uh, very well mentioned by Anjali. I think workshops are very important. Even if you don't get the time for workshops, just create a bulleted list of steps that you would be following. Mm -hmm. Right. The first could be orientation of the use case that you are dealing with the problem part. Next could be the research. Mention mm -hmm. research, right, because research in any kind of design field is very, very important right what is building the domain knowledge for you let's say you are a conversation designer you are an you are an sme in copywriting and ux but you are not an sme in stock brokerage mm -hmm. or insurance right so research plays a very huge part and when you show that you tell them that dude i am learning about your industry mm -hmm. i am i am giving it that importance right so that becomes very important that's one point next definitely definitely use you know prototyping tools or mm -hmm. anything that can easily depict your design 
generally for conversational flows it's flow chat like draw.io as mentioned by anjali also but uh, imagine a vast use case you won't be able to do justice to all of it if you just send it to them you mm. want to divide them into sub flows let's say or you want to divide them into shorter user journeys from end to end and you can even put dummy conversations in that to give them a look and feel mm. if they are still not able to understand then just create prototypes using let's say bot mock bot society for chat mm. uh, and uh, let's say fable.io or uh, you know anything voice flow for voice right so these help you create very easy and you know plug and play kind of prototypes you mm. can give them these demos which can you know uh, sound like the actual example of a bot conversation whereas it's just a recorded conversation mm. right as uh, anjali also mentioned play the part of a user and a bot or maybe if you have tts in built use the tts for the bot part use your voice your own voice as the user part and you try to show positive negative hk handling uh, playbacks of you know uh, returning to the track all of these things through tiny tiny 3 4 minutes ke videos right mm. and that creates a lot of impact i think everyone wants to see because people are still getting used to understanding the ai space right a lot of uh, things are confused even uh, within the customers that whether this is a machine learning thing or this is a conversation design team thing right you don't have to segregate that in their head you can't you can't train them what you can do give them the look and feel and do justice to it because if you over preach and you can't deliver that that is going to be a problem as well so when you are sharing any demos or prototypes keep it true to what you can actually deliver and show all the possible cases yeah absolutely yes uh abhi no what do you say uh, about showcasing your conversation design to the customers or clients yeah i think most of the points um anjali and tias they've covered but i just want to emphasize on one point i mm. i just cannot emphasize more on setting the expectation right with the clients mm. because some of them come in with an understanding they have from the movies right some of them think that um, every cai the conversational ai is already like jarvis from marvel cinematic universe or uh, it's there's samantha from her the movie so the first step is to make them understand that if it's not in the design the conversational ai is probably not going to say it right so this is this is very crucial mm. and maybe we will have uh, for instance emilia she has some built in capabilities where she will respond to certain uh, social talk and all of that which are editable but you know if if it's your domain you mm. need to teach it to the bot otherwise the bot is not going to say it and we are not industry experts mm. uh, so if you need uh, facts or uh, you know your industry related information you need to give it to us we are conversational designers we are not experts of the field mm. and i like i i mean i do most of my designing not most i do my designing on lucid chat uh, mm. so there is always a first draft that i do i walk them through uh, uh, walk the clients through the design completely and at each juncture i'm going to tell them what the bot is going to say right yeah. so this gives them a clear understanding of uh, the conversation itself and for first time clients it uh, sometimes it gives them an understanding of how the conversation is going to progress so i'm talking about uh, pre demo stage so this is the very mm-hmm. basic uh, so yeah so drill into them the idea that the conversational ai will only be able to say what we teach it to say and it will not magically weave conversation and uh, you know uh, have opinions about certain things like a human being would uh, yeah so- absolutely yes yeah. yes on point uh, setting the right expectations and of course as tias and anjali they both mentioned preparation is the most important as well so anjali um, what do you think is the most valuable skill in conversation design is it uh, storytelling is it language accuracy what do you think it is and uh, what are the recommended tools for designing uh, uh, in your opinion uh, and is it same for chat voice and multimodal what is it um okay i'll start with the most important yeah. skills um i think it's a little difficult to call out any one particular skill but mm-hmm. um aside from the very obvious you know a logical or creative thinking i i would i think i'd i'd like to give the spotlight to adaptability 
um, because it's a trait that would really help you set apart and you know kind of rise to the top. Um, and I say this because I think we somebody mentioned this at the, at the very beginning of the call. Um, all of us come from very different backgrounds, right? Mm -hmm. And um, even 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 my team, right? We have psychologists, we have engineers, we have graphic designers, um, we have uh, English teachers um, or journalists. You know, everyone's kind of shape shifted into conversation designers, um, yeah. and and we did that because we we kind of conducted self some sort of research ourselves, or we kind of learn from one another. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, we have, we do have some skills, but we also kind of, we still do lack some crucial skills uh, that an ideal, you know, conversation designer is, is expected to have. So in order to kind of move forward, become experts, I think what we need to do is, is really have an open mind and adapt. Um, so whether it is, you know, to uh, write more effectively or maybe get better at understanding, you know, the business objectives mm -hmm. or really uh, know how to step into the shoes of a user and think from their perspective. Um, maybe you want to, you know, dabble into a little bit of behavioral science. Maybe you want to, um, you know, uh, learn or some new or popular tool or, or mm -hmm you, you know, um, want to get better at client interactions, whichever skill it may be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think like without the ability to expand and involve, evolve, mm -hmm. um, I, I think you'll, you'll just, you know, be tied down to the basics. So right. I think I, I, I would say adaptability. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we also have uh, Sakshi. She has some questions. Sakshi, why don't you unmute yourself and ask your question? Um, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I think it was a wonderful session so far, uh, but uh, I do have another question to uh, highlight. So as conversation designers, uh, we do understand that, you know, AI has certain limitations, uh, certain loopholes here and there. And we also understand that not everything is always technically possible. And, uh, and since we're working on this for a while now, we also understand that th this from a very, uh, you know, from a very microscopic point of view. So how can we uh, put this forward to a client who may come up with a very unreasonable requirement time and again? Because what they may perceive AI to be is completely different from what we look at it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, to them, AI is this, uh, you know, a huge innovation that has uh, almost taken the world by storm. And, you know, there, there is very little scope for limitation. They, they look at it from a very high level perspective. So how can we uh, kind of change that perspective and explain it in a very uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a rightful manner. Yeah, that's, that's a very elaborative uh, question. Anjali, uh, why don't you continue answering uh, Sakshi's question as well? Um, okay, so I, I think a lot of us have been through this, this issue. Um, <laughs> so I think, I yeah. think uh, before we are introduced to the client or we come into the picture, I think the client's first um, contact point would probably be your pre-sale sales teams. So I would say, um, you know, partner up with them, make sure all of you guys are on the same page and the, that's where the journey actually begins. So mm -hmm. the expectations that need to be set right starts there. So um, if something is, you know, over-promised there, then these, these kind of issues, uh, you're gonna face it later on. Mm -hmm. you know, months down the line where you actually sit down with the client to design the solution and deliver it. So I would say nip it in the bud and uh, just work with the pre-sales. <laughs> <Sales team. laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, Anjali, what is the, what are the recommended tools for designing conversation experience? Mm, tools, okay. Yeah. Um, I think this, this, I think it kind of varies from team to team. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can speak from my team's experience. So we were highly dependent on the wonderful bot society, um, you know, and much to our horror, it just, just, you know, out of the blue, just became defunct uh, earlier this year. And then, you know, we all kind of just scrambled to find the right alternative, right? Um, so when we were doing that, what we um, tried to focus on were the kind of features we were looking for in that tool. So what we wanted was, 
um, like a scratch pad or a canvas tool that you know was easy to learn if somebody was new to it. Um, and also that that would allow for very easy collaboration and also version control. Um, right. Because we work with a lot of Indian clients who really want to change the designs every now and then they have something to add something new to that they you know come up with. Um, so this was very important to us. Um, and we, uh, you know, we also have um, strict deadlines. So our projects are um, high velocity, uh, you know, um, projects, majority of the times. So it has to be something that's, that's really easy. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't want to use one tool for like, a, you know, practice or, or canvassing and then, you know, like another tool to put everything together as a demo. Um, so we did, uh, you know, do our research. And um, we ended up finding Solus in, in Draw.io and our own platform. So, um, you know, uh, the answer to why this worked or, or is working for us, I think it's, it's more to do with the way we approach conversation design. So our team is really involved at the very beginning of, of the entire implementation, yeah. right? So we have a lot of collaborative um, design or discovery sessions with the client. So we need to factor in things like, you know, uh, possibility of multiple iterations, or we need to cater to, you know, the customer's desire to be very collaborative. And also, how tech savvy are they, right? So, um, you know, uh, we kind of um, decided Draw.io uh, was a very seamless and easy, awesome tool. And it's something that the developers were used to, the business analysts were used to, even a lot of the client teams, um, you know, they were they were quite comfortable using that tool. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, uh, once we have a proper vision as to how each journey is supposed to unfold, then what mm -hmm. we do is we use our own um, platform to kind of onboard our designs because it's, it's a low code platform and it's very easy to use. And then we just make minor tweaks um, mm -hmm. and we, it, you know, it, it comes with a simulator and we kind of um, just do a quick demo and then showcase it, our prototype to, to the customers. And um, because at the end of the day, they just want a taste of what is the end user getting? That's yeah, it. Absolutely. So this is, this is what worked for us for both. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. for, for every kind of channel, like chat, voice, everything. Okay. Uh, Miru, what is your take on this? Uh, what do you think is the most valuable skill to have in conversation design? Um, yeah, so the most valuable skill in conversation designing, in my opinion, would be the ability to see right through a use case. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so of course, storytelling, language accuracy, etc., that will come uh, with it, uh, but it will not prove useful if you do not if you've if you've not accounted for most if not all the potential parts the conversation could go in right, right. Uh, if you come to think of it this is one area where your overthinking will actually help you right mm -hmm. the cad uh, one should have the ability to anticipate possible user responses and design for them um, that extra effort that we take to design mm -hmm. a default path at all points will definitely help the conversation flow more smoothly uh, so yeah so that's that's what i think the ability to perceive the use case as a whole and and also when it comes to different channels the ability to tweak the conversation based on the channel that also becomes important so mindfulness is key here right uh, so if so for instance you cannot convey an email address the same way we will do i mean it, in voice and chat we will convey an email address differently. So in voice, you might want to spell it out. Uh, we might want to ask if uh, they'd like to hear it, they'd like to hear the address again, or if they want to, you know, uh, if they want some time to note it down, right? Um, whereas in chat, you just need to display it once and it's always there. So you don't, you, you need to design accordingly, according to the model. So adaptability, like Anjali said, uh, so tailoring it to suit the channel that's a very crucial skill to have. Um, now, coming to the tools, um, I, I like I mentioned, I design on Lucidchat and I find it extremely convenient. Uh, I'm able to outline my thoughts very quickly and then flesh it out. And uh, it, it's, it's a great tool to get that first draft out. And I do this despite the channel. So I might have different tabs for voice, chat, teams or whatever. Uh, 
the channel uh, and i'm talking about the very first draft right the pre demo stage so after this design is logged in uh, we develop it on emilia uh, separately uh, we uh, collaborate with the technical team and then we develop it we show them a demo mm -hmm. uh, and yeah so at, at so for the clients they need to know what at what at i mean the points that um, see uh, for the unhappy path right that's what the clients would be uh, worried about so if we show it to them they they are also convinced that okay the bot will be able to perform uh, well so uh, yes so lucid chart works for me as a tool yeah. and it, and i i advocate lucid <laughs> Yeah, um, we have Neha who also have, uh, she has some question. Neha, why don't you unmute yourself and ask the question? Thank you. Hey, everyone. Uh, my question is that a lot of times as a conversation designer, you're working with the client and the company. Um, you're designing this bot for them. That will now finally be used by right their customers or the end user. So you're thinking about both of these different audiences when designing uh, does that ever become a challenge and if so how do you navigate that um, and I'm thinking about this specifically wherein let's say a client it's e-commerce right and they want to push sales and your chatbot needs to help people navigate um, while that's great and that's what the business is looking for we will also of course think of that end user who doesn't want something pushed in their face and rather maybe wants to have gentle nudges to guide them through that buying journey so how do you navigate such challenges yeah, Minu, uh, do you want to answer this question? Uh, we can't hear you, Minu. At least I can't. Yeah, okay. Um, Minu, uh, are you still facing uh, some problem? I think Minu is not able yeah, to okay. unmute. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, Tia, sir, can you answer this question, please? Uh, the question by Neha or yes. the one on screen? By Neha, sir. Okay, uh, sure. I think, um, okay, I kind of lost track of the question. Um, yeah, I'll just go to what Neha was asking. What are some of the challenges that are some designing for multiple stakeholders, not designing for which will then be used by the end customer? How do you navigate them? Okay, yeah. So I think uh, when you're when you're designing for multiple stakeholders, right, you need to have in mind like who you're designing for again, right? That is your that is your north star. So if you're designing for a uh, for a company which will later be used by their end users, so again you need to have a flexible design in place, right? You need to create a scenario where you are able to just customize it to a little bit and then you can, uh, like they can take it forward to their customers. So the approach should be that your designs, when you know, if you have a forecast of it, will be really good. That will help you create a flexible path towards your design. If you don't have a forecast of it, try to make the tweaks or try to show certain areas or navigation that is solely catering to the larger target target audience, which is not your customer anymore. Did I understand the question correctly? Or uh... yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. And then dress. Uh, okay, in the interest of time, I'm stepping in here. Sorry, uh, we have run about 20, 22 minutes uh, over. We can probably stay for another 10 minutes. Uh, so maybe we can answer the questions that we have first in audience. I've also posted a link for the CXD India community that we've put for you. 
you can also ask the questions there all our uh, speakers will hopefully join the community and keep answering those questions i can also answer the questions for you uh, so i would request that let's wrap up in the next 10 minutes uh, so that uh, you know we can end the session thereafter but uh, over back back to you bhagishri and yeah. sorry for butting in <laughs> no no it was uh, yeah that's that's okay so um should we okay should we take um the next question um right now so what do you think um uh, is the better channel in india uh, is it chat or voice and why do you think so okay i will try to quickly wrap this up because um uh, you know according to me i don't think uh, the choice of chat and voice de or depends on the particular demographic that you are catering to according to me the choice of chat and voice is a problem that you are solving mm -hmm. so if you are sitting in india solving for let's say um, um a fintech company right and the particular use cases that you want to serve for that company you check the criticality of those use cases and based on that you want to make the choice of chat and voice let's say a person uh, does not always have their uh, let's say a insurance company right a person does not always have their policy number handy on chat typing it out would be easier than spelling it out on voice so it might be an approach that you want to take where you're designing for that particular use case only on chat right, right. and similarly when you try to just uh, you know uh, book a appointment for a diagnostic center right? right you want a human touch you want a human help or you want to hear somebody you know s somewhere assisting or being empathetic towards you because you are in a sensitive situation right mm -hmm. so at that point maybe voice is a better option so do not stick your path as to the demography that i'm working because i'm sure after 2010 even our parents are using whatsapp right mm -hmm. so after 2010 whatsapp and facebook has made sure that all of us type sometime or the other so you can't just say that only the younger generation will do chat bot and the older generation would do voice bot right mm -hmm. so it depends on the use case that you're serving and the criticality of it so take your decision based on that uh, to move to the next part uh, i would just try to wrap it up that the challenge is involved in both the channels right one to talk about chat i would say that it is a less little less personal in nature until and unless you're designing for whatsapp which is directly your phone number if it is a, hosted on your website or it's hosted on an app or a integrated platform somewhere you can't really be very personal to the user you can't really call them hi bhagyashri how are you doing today mm -hmm. you will probably say dear customer how are you doing today mm -hmm. right so there you are cutting down on the personalization bit or maybe just for personalization you would ask the user to validate themselves mm -hmm. right so that is an extra mile for the user so i think the personalization part gets a little missed in chat that is why we i think avani was also stressing that is why we use a lot of visual uh, things right cards or emojis or buttons and things like that which can engage people a bigger challenge in voice i would say is the attention span of customers right yeah. or and end users because when you hear something when you read something you can always scroll up and go back to it but when you hear something it's done it was that much only and it's done so you have to grab the attention within 15 to 20 seconds max you can't stagger a prompt more than that probably right so try to keep it short even if you have a larger information take help of multimodal facilities if you have that leverage if you don't break your information at every step asking for a engaging question should we move ahead or would you like to know more these kind yeah. of things which is pulling in the user's attention somehow so you're breaking down the challenges so yes. i think yeah that would be my take yes. yeah anjali uh, what do you say um, uh, do you have any um, inputs in this quickly can you uh, yeah yeah so um, i would say that yeah i i don't think i can choose voice over chat or vice versa i also think that it really depends on the use case and the you know the user persona um in the interest of time i think i i probably just take you know one small example um so you know just keeping in mind that you know we we are a huge country different cultures we have um you know 22 main languages and so many other mother tongues right um which automatically sort of creates a very like like an expansive and very target user base so mm -hmm. mapping that to the most popular industry use cases 
um, like customer service, and banking, retail sectors. Um, it's it's a challenge, and um, you know, um, it, it's all about how do you make a very inclusive conversational experience in that case, right? So, right. just for an example, um, let's say voice bot, right? Uh, recognizing common slang terms and a manner of speech, it could be quite tricky. So, I, I, I'm actually from Kerala. And um, the way someone speaks in, let's say, the district of Gasargord up north would be completely different from, let's say, someone in Tirana, right? Mm -hmm. So capturing their intents or inputs and for the SCT engine to then process the information, it, it could be troublesome, right? It could lead to errors. Um, but, you know, any Malayali would, would definitely be mm -hmm. able to understand the common dialect, right? So there's no trouble when it comes to users understanding the bot. So then we kind of, think of, okay, maybe we should use DTMF, right? That'll come in handy to reduce the chance of error. Um, and it'll it'll help us keep the user on the happy path. Um, yeah. And then that in turn provides a quicker, fruitful journey and then reduces the AHT. Um, but these days, everyone is aware of human-like bots. Every business mm -hmm. out there wants to have their own voice assistant that is completely conversational. So, you know, then how do you re reduce the chance of error if this is your target user? Um, persona, right? So these yeah. are the kind of challenges that, that we've also seen. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Anjali and other speakers as well. I sadly have to read this slide. I want to thank um, all of the speakers and uh, the participants as well. Uh, I would request uh, the question to be added on the group so that um, these uh, experts would answer your questions and you'll get the answers uh, on the group uh, at the same time. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Let's keep in touch and continue thank you so these kind of thank sessions. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.